All right, let's talk inertia for a second. The quick summary of this whole thing is, from the Dyna results that we've measured, we can calculate the moment of inertia of both the bell of the motor and of any prop that we run on the motor. And from that moment of inertia, we can tell between any two props which one is going to accelerate quicker. And by combining that with the uh, dyno results that we have, we can actually calculate just how quickly that prop will accelerate uh, for any given load. So now for just a little bit of background, you intuitively understand that a heavier object is going to accelerate more slowly than a lighter object. The moment of inertia has to do with a rotational acceleration of an object. Two objects that weigh the same amount can have different amounts of rotational acceleration. If we, for example, have a prop that has a tiny hub and big blades that weighs the same as a prop that has a big hub and tiny blades, even if they're the same weight, because the, uh, the prop that has more of its weight in the blades, this one is going to s accelerate more slowly than the one that has the big, more of its weight in the hub. Now this doesn't mean that this prop is going to spin slower once it gets to full speed. It's going to take longer to get up to the full speed compared to this other prop. Because the closer to the center that your weight is, the less effect that it has on your rotational acceleration. This is why prop nuts and prop screws and stuff like that have proportionally a, a relatively tiny effect on the uh, acceleration of your motor, even if you try to do uh, super lightweight, uh, you know, aluminum nuts or, or stuff like that compared to, to even steel, because your prop nut is right dead center over the, the, uh, the middle of the rotation there. So it's going to have very, very little effect on the overall acceleration. Now, calculating the moment of inertia from the results that we have on the dyno is really, really simple because torque equals the moment of inertia times the acceleration. That's it. And we already know the torque because we're measuring that directly. We know the angular acceleration because we're recording the RPM and we can compare the RPM between two samples and know how much acceleration we've had in that sample. The only question mark is the inertia. And there are some things that uh, we know that we can know up front that will help us derive this from uh, the results that we're seeing. The moment of inertia never changes. It's a physical property of the mass of the motor and the prop so that we can calculate the moment of inertia constantly over the entire test. And we know that as, as long as the result that we get doesn't change, no matter what voltage or what throttle position, or if the motor's spinning fast or slow, as long as the inertia that we calculate is the same, then we have a pretty good confidence that we're seeing is actually, uh, the number that we're seeing is actually correct, and that it's not being influenced uh, by other things, or we're not making mistakes in our calculation. So now let's take a bit of a step through looking at actual recorded results from the dyno. And there are some tricky bits that we run into that we have to compensate for before we can get a, uh, an accurate uh, inertial reading. So to measure the inertia, we have a test program that looks like this. This is the RPM of the test. We uh, ramp up to an idle speed and then snap up to a 65% throttle and uh, just have a hard acceleration. There's no uh, smoothing on the throttle here. We go from 25 to 65% throttle, and this is the motor accelerating as quickly as it possibly can. So if we take the motor and have nothing on it, no prop, no uh, brake disc, and measure the RPM completely unloaded, and then calculate the inertia, we get a result that looks like this. And this is already looking really, really promising. We have a nice flat response. And due to the, uh, the calculation as the acceleration approaches zero, uh, the numbers start swinging bigger and bigger. So all of this is here is just noise. And uh, we expect that our calculations are going to be bad when we're not in an area that's under really heavy acceleration. So we want to look at just this section here and 
it's nice and flat and we're getting an even result. And so it looks like this is everything that we wanted. So now we can throw the brake disc on, which slows the acceleration of the motor down uh, quite a lot because uh, it's, it's pretty heavy. It's just a solid aluminum disc. And when we calculate the inertia based on that, all of a sudden things kind of go pear-shaped. This is no longer flat and the difference between three grams centimeter cubed and eight. This is like a massive swing and it's ramping up and down and something is obviously really, really wrong here. And the reason for this is if we naively assume that all of the torque that the motor gives us can go into acceleration. If we look back at what the actual individual uh, runs from the dyno look like, remember when we've talked about uh, prop acceleration, how we're coming from uh, one position here, we're jumping up to another band and riding that band down, down to where our static torque is. And as we get closer to that static torque, the, the amount of excess torque above our static torque load line um, diminishes. You might think that this chart goes all the way down to the bottom, but it doesn't actually. This is the zero line right there. And even with no prop on the motor, with just the disc, you notice that there's a small amount of torque here at really high RPM that's being applied to the motor. And if we zoom in on this really close, you can see this curve. And this is just the drag on the bearings and very small effects like that give us a, a torque even though there's no thrust or resistance on the disc at all but we still have this tiny tiny amount of residual torque and we need to compensate for this just like uh, as we're approaching the loaded uh, value for a prop this is our loaded value for the uh, the dyno uh, as well so if we take this and make a torque curve out of this and apply that as a compensation curve and rerun the numbers on that that same test, we get something that looks like this, and this looks a lot more reasonable. We have some noise that we've got to kind of compensate for, and we have the, the drop off where uh, acceleration approaches zero and our results start to get crazy, but right in here, this is looking pretty reasonably flat. Certainly good enough to take a, an average or a median value and have something that's uh, close to uh, realistic that we can, uh, can work with but we run into another problem. Like I said earlier, the moment of inertia is a static value. It doesn't change over time. So as we change the, the conditions of the test, as long as we're, we're, we have the same motor and the same brake disc mounted, the moment of inertia is always the same. And if we take this test and run it on 3S instead of 4S, all of a sudden we get a really different value. Rather than uh, like 3.2, we're getting a higher value or a lower value. And that points to we have something else wrong. And this wasn't even an issue with the calculation of the inertia. This has to do with what we're looking at on the dyno chart. So let's look at a raw reading of a dyno run, and we're just doing the speed test with the brake disc. In this one, the uh, the inertial run that we're, we've been looking at is this top line here where it's all in kind of dark, dark blue. And the dyno run that we're basing our torque values off of is this one here down at the bottom that curves off. So if we look at just the, uh, the torque readings on this inertial run, so we start at zero and we sit at uh, our, our idle, our 25% idle. And just like when we talked about in the uh, inertia, motor inertia video before, when we uh, adjust the throttle up, snap the throttle up, immediately we jump to a top torque band, the same line that uh, the 65% throttle uh, curve gets us. And then we ride that line all the way down to our no load uh, section where we reach our uh, static torque value down uh, near no load. But the dyno run has this curve here at the top. And before I had said that this looks like a um, magnetic saturation, the beginnings of magnetic saturation, where it starts to the, the torque and the efficiency starts to drop off and the torque production starts to drop off as well. But obviously that can't be right because when we're inert, doing the inertial testing, we are getting this amount of torque out of the motor. 
And if we were magnetically saturated or, or starting to be magnetically saturated, that wouldn't be possible. The current in order to get that torque would saturate the stator and, and we wouldn't be able to get those torque values out at all. So something else is going on here. And I think what we're seeing, this is actually a uh, thermal soak on the motor itself because these two tests happen backwards from each other. In the inertial test, we start at zero RPM and then we idle at a very low RPM, snap up to full load, and then the load drops off uh, as it accelerates up to what its ultimate uh, no load RPM is. In the dyno run, we ramp up slowly to our no load RPM, and then we apply more and more and more load. And over a period of several seconds, we increase the load and then increase the current and power that we're putting into the motor. So by the time it gets to this really heavily loaded section, it's been running under very heavy load for several seconds. And especially on this tiny 1106 motor, we might be putting a 100 watts into it at this point. So the difference between these two lines is that this motor has been under heavy load for several seconds and is starting to warm up a lot, where the inertial test uh, is starting from cold and hasn't warmed up at all. So this is actually the true performance of the motor. And if we had better cooling, then we wouldn't see this drop off here. So that means when we're using this dyno curve in our uh, calculations for inertia, we're actually underestimating the amount of torque that the motor has by quite a bit. Is the, uh, the torque values that we're at here is about 2.2 uh, Newton centimeters, but the actual torque that the motor is going to be somewhere more around 3.2 or 3. So we can rework our, the torque curve because we know from the inertial run that this is the actual torque curve of the motor at this point. When we're not uh, overheating it, we can use that torque curve uh, in our inertial estimation and that corrects this value up. It gives us a higher inertial inertia reading, but all of a sudden now when we compare this test on 3S and 4S, we get the same numbers no matter what voltage we tested at, which is exactly what we're looking for. So now we have a test that's consistent no matter what our situation is. We've discovered some uh, issues with our dyno readings on, on heat soak on the dyno readings for outside of this inertia readings as well. And to help us make sure that what we're actually looking at here is correct, when we did the inertial readings, uh, it was done on the dyno itself. So we actually were reading the torque off the dyno as well. We don't have to use the torque values that we calculated based on the uh, the resistance dyno runs, we can actually, for this test, also compare it with the, in, the torque values that were recorded during the inertial run. And we can see that if we toggle back and forth between these, we have that huge section of, uh, of noise where the acceleration approaches zero, but over here where we have high acceleration, we're right in the same ballpark with our calculated values combining uh, all of the different resistive dyno runs with the inertial readings and the unloaded values compared with the numbers that were recorded all at the same time of the test. So it looks like all of our compensation has got us right into the right place. There's one more thing that we can do to help us be sure that these values that we're calculating how close we are to the uh, real inertial values. So now we have two different inertia readings. We have the unloaded uh, inertia reading, which will give us the moment of inertia for the motor bell itself, all the magnets and the flux ring, everything that's on it. We have a final reading of about 1.52 gram centimeters squared for just the motor. We can compare that with the value that we have here, where we have the moment of inertia calculated for the uh, the dyno break, and this value is about 6.23 gram centimeters squared. Now this includes both the motor bell and the brake disc itself. So if we subtract those, we can calculate that the moment of inertia of the brake disc for the dyno is 4.71 gram centimeters squared. And I don't have any sort of like test inertia uh, that I can put on there like you get test weights to uh, calibrate your scale or, or the load cell. But what we can do 
is take our calculated value for the moment of inertia here, 4.71, and very carefully measure the brake disc. Recreate it in CAD, apply the correct material, and when we do a mass analysis of the CAD model, it tells us that our moment of inertia is 4.69 gram centimeters. So our calculated value with all that that we've gone through uh, is only about 0 0.02 gram centimeters high, 0.4%, which is good enough for me. And in our uh, calculated value and in our CAD value here, we're not taking into account the mass of the uh, two screws that hold it in as well. So the value here is going to be slightly low than what the uh, actual measured value uh, we have should, should really be. So I am perfectly happy with that. And while I think this particular, the accuracy of this uh, one particular run is maybe a little optimistic compared to what we'll see uh, when doing all of the, the props and stuff over time. But if we're within a couple percent or so, that's more than enough to use to really compare different props together. And when we calculate the value for props, we have to do all of the same things we've done here, measuring the uh, static torque load um, of the prop and using that to compensate for the acceleration offset. And all of our results should be uh, should work out just uh, just like this one has.